Good morning. Good morning. My name's Dr Farrant. Can I just check your name, please? It's Jen Tomlinson. Thank you for letting me examine you today. Okay. Can we just pull the sheet down for me, if possible, please? And take a nice deep breath in. And out. Big cough for me. <laughs> Thank you. Can I have a look at your hands, please? Turn them over. Can you just put them out like that for me now? And cock the wrists back. That's great. Let me relax that hand down now. Can you pull down on one of your eyelids for me, please? That's great. And if you could open your mouth for me now, if possible. And lift the tongue. And can I see your teeth? If you can now just rest your head back and look towards that wall for me. Do you have any pain in your abdomen? No. I'm just going to press on it. I'm now just going to have a feel of your neck. Okay. I'm just going to have a look at your chest now, if possible. And could you just lift the bra slightly for me, please? That's great. Thank you. I'm just going to place a hand on your chest now, okay? Deep breath in for me. And out. And again. And out. That's great. If you could just say 99 for me. 99. And again. 99. And again. 99. And again. 99. Okay. If you could just take some nice deep breaths in and out when I place my stethoscope on your chest, okay? And if you could just say 99 when I place my stethoscope on your chest now. 99. Okay, if you could just sit forward for me now, please. Could you just take a nice deep breath in for me, please? And out. And again. And out. Just going to have a tap on your back now. Can you just say 99 for me, please? 99. And again? 99. And again? 99. You have and one again. minute remaining. 99. You just take a nice deep breath in for me, please. And out. And again. And out. And again. And out. 
And again. And out. And again. And out. And again. And out. And again. And out. And again. And out. Say 99 for me, please. 99. And again. 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 99. If you allow yourself back, we'll just give you back up for a second. All right, and I'll just have a look at your legs. Thank you. So to complete my examination, I would like to perform a full set of bedside observations, do a peak flow and some bedside spirometry. Please can you present your findings? So I believe that this patient has had a double lung transplant. Uh, this is, I've let, come to this conclusion from the uh, clam shell incision that she has uh, throughout the, the front of her chest. Um, she also has evidence of five intercostal drain site scars, four on the front and one on the back. Uh, in inspection of the neck, she has evidence of a previous tracheostomy and uh, central line insertion. I do currently believe that the transplant is working well as she does not have any evidence of central or peripheral cyanosis uh, and she's not requiring any supplemental oxygen therapy. Uh, she does have evidence of uh, an, uh, transplant rejection medication usage through a tremor uh, on inspection of her hands. As to the underlying etiology of the condition, uh, I cannot be certain, um, but there was possibly evidence of uh, clubbing on inspection of her hands, um, which may uh, lead to the underlying etiology being um, bronchiectasis or uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Is there anything else that you would have liked to have done when examining this patient? Uh, particularly, I would have liked to examine this patient's uh, lymph nodes. Okay, so can you tell me about the commonest indications for lung transplantation? So the commonest indications for lung transplant uh, is, via, is through patients with CF, uh, cystic fibrosis or bronchiectasis. Um, patients can also have a lung transplant for pulmonary vascular disease uh, or forms of pulmonary fibrosis. Can you think of any other indications? Uh, COPD uh, would be another indication for uh, lung transplantation, but in general they are uh, single lung transplants as opposed to the double lung transplants that you would see in this case. So what would be the usual um, indications to do a double lung transplant? Why would you choose to do a double over a single lung? Um, the prognosis uh, from a double lung transplant as opposed to a single lung transplant is greater. Um, normally, uh, patients with cystic fibrosis and patients with bronchiectasis would receive a double lung transplant. Uh, and then there are some indications uh, sometimes as to why patients with pulmonary vascular disease or pulmonary fibrosis would re receive a double lung transplant as well as opposed to a single. Okay, can you tell me a bit about the medications that can be used in lung transplantation? So patients in lung transplantation are generally on um, a combination of anti-rejection medications. Uh, normally it's a combination of um, tacrolimus, mycophenolate and steroid therapy. Um, cyclosporin is something that was historically used but is less commonly used now because of the risk of renal, uh, renal failure. Can you tell me about some complications or potential complications of lung transplantation? So in the acute phase uh, there's hyperacute rejection of the, the lung transplant. Um, there's also evidence of opportunistic, opportunistic infections that can um, cause damage to the transplant and then um, as time progresses patients become increasingly susceptible to bronchiolitis obliterans which is, new, which is usually a terminal event. Do you know of any contraindications to lung transplantation? So contraindications of lung transplantation would include uh, patients with uh, malignancies within the last five years, patients with particularly high or low BMIs, uh, patients who are currently smoking or using illicit drugs, patients with mental health conditions that would preclude them from taking medications on a regular basis or uh, regularly being able to turn up to um, any clinic appointments. 
Lung transplantation may well appear in your PACES exam, and you may see a patient with a giveaway clamshell incision from a double lung transplant, or you may be faced with a single lung transplant or heart and lung transplant case. And in these cases, you may find a median sternotomy scar and or a lateral thoracotomy scar. Make sure you also take note of any tracheostomy and intercostal drain scars, and if found, comment on them as part of your presentation. In a double lung transplant case, the examination may be otherwise completely normal. However, look closely for finger clubbing that may be seen in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, cystic fibrosis or bronchiectasis. Particularly for single lung transplants, examine the native lung closely. Is there anything that you can detect clinically that will tell you what the indication for the transplant was, such as evidence of COPD or interstitial lung disease? Lung transplantation should be considered for adults with chronic end-stage lung disease who meet three criteria. Firstly, they should have a greater than 50% risk of death from lung disease within two years if transplant is not performed. Secondly, they should have a greater than 80% likelihood of surviving at least 90 days post-transplant. And thirdly, they should have a greater than 80% likelihood of a five-year post-transplant survival from a general, general medical perspective, provided there is adequate graft function. So in other words, you need to be sick enough to need a transplant, but fit enough to survive major surgery and have no severe comorbidities. The commonest conditions for which lung transplant are performed are interstitial lung disease, cystic fibrosis, COPD and pulmonary vascular diseases. Overall, median survival post-lung transplantation is six years, but bilateral lung transplant recipients have a better median survival, so about seven and a half years versus four and a half years for a single lung transplant. Patients with COPD and idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis have poorer 10-year survival than cystic fibrosis or pulmonary hypertension. Early complications of lung transplant include primary graft dysfunction, also known as acute rejection, which is common and most patients will experience at least one episode in the first six months post-transplant. Chronic rejection is usually due to bronchiolitis obliterans syndrome, which is usually abbreviated to BOS, and is the leading cause of death after the first year. An incidence approaches 50% by five years. Other significant complications include infections, including bacterial, mycobacterial, fungal and viral. Patients are also at increased risk of malignancy and post-transplant lymphoproliferative disease is the most common malignancy in the first year after transplant. Skin malignancies are also common and should be regularly screened for. Complications of immunosuppression may include typical steroid side effects from glucocorticoids, including a Cushingoid appearance, decreased bone density, skin thinning and diabetes. Patients on tacrolimus may also develop diabetes or may have a tremor, particularly if levels are high. Renal and hearing impairment may occur from long-term use of anti-rejection medication and frequent antibiotic courses, including the use of aminoglycosides. Classically, single lung transplants are performed in patients with COPD or interstitial lung disease, with double lung transplants being reserved for suppurative lung diseases, such as cystic fibrosis or generalised bronchiectasis. However, due to the improved post-transplant survival with double lung transplantation, they may be performed for any indication once risks and benefits have been assessed. So in younger patients with interstitial lung disease or COPD, or patients with these conditions who have secondary pulmonary hypertension, a double lung transplant may be preferred. Absolute contraindications to lung transplant are, are, are broad. Firstly, a history of malignancy in the past five years or in the previous two years if malignancy has a low risk of uh, recurrence, for example, a basal cell skin carcinoma. If a patient has untreatable significant heart, liver, kidney or brain dysfunction, uh, unless combined organ transplantation can be performed. If a patient has uncorrected atherosclerotic disease with suspected or confirmed in-organ ischemia or dysfunction and or coronary artery disease not amenable to revascularisation. Acute illnesses such as sepsis, myocardial infarction and hepatic failure would be contraindications, as would chronic infection with highly virulent or resistant organisms that are poorly controlled pre-transplant. Mycobacterium abscessus, particularly seen in patients uh, in some patients with cystic fibrosis, is deemed a contraindication, as is significant chest, wall or spinal deformities, uh, obese patients with a BMI of over 35. Current uh, non-adherence to therapies would be a worrying sign, um, suggesting someone shouldn't be transplanted. And as, as mentioned by the candidate here, significant psychiatric or psychological conditions with an inability to cooperate with treatments in the healthcare team. 
if a patient has no social support system or has a severely impaired functional status with very poor rehab potential, that would be a contraindication, as would substance abuse, including smoking or substance dependence. Uh, relative contraindications would include an age greater than 65, particularly for a single lung transplant. A younger age limit of 60 may be applied for a more major surgery of a double lung transplant. If someone has a BMI of over 30 or uh, has severe malnutrition, and certainly in uh, a local centre, um, a BMI of less than 17 would deem a patient ineligible for transplantation. And severe osteoporosis or resistant organisms colonising the patient, such as Burkholderia sinusopatia. The timing of referral to the lung transplant team depends on the lung condition, but ideally referrals should be made early in suitable patients. For example, in interstitial lung disease, which carries the worst prognosis of all disease indications for lung transplantation, all patients with usual interstitial pneumonia or fibrotic NSIP, that's non-specific interstitial pneumonia, who have no contraindication should be considered for a referral, regardless of their lung function. Patients with other types of interstitial lung disease, such as non-fibrotic or cellular NSIP, should be referred if their forced vital capacity is less than 80% or their transfer factor is less than 40% or any oxygen requirement or symptomatic dyspnea. This does not mean that these patients will be immediately listed, rather that they can complete a full and timely transplant assessment and be listed if shown to be rapidly deteriorating, for example a greater than 10% drop in FVC within six months. Cystic fibrosis carries the best post-transplant survival. Patients should be considered for referral when FEV1 drops to less than 30% and patients have a poor exercise tolerance, significant pulmonary arterial hypertension, instability including high exacerbation frequency, recurrent pneumothoraces, life-threatening hemoptysis despite bronchial artery embolisation or requirement for non-invasive ventilation. COPD is the commonest indication for lung transplantation and accounts for 40% of lung transplants worldwide. In COPD, transplant is more likely to improve quality of life rather than significantly extend life. And so timing of lung transplantation is difficult. The patients with COPD who are most likely to gain a survival advantage are those with a Bode index score of greater than 7. Post-transplant, all patients will receive lifelong immunosuppression, typically with a combination of prednisolone, a calcineurin inhibitor such as cyclosporin or tacrolimus, and a nucleotide blocking agent such as azathioprine or mycophenolate mofetil. Patients will also require prophylactic medications to prevent opportunistic infection.